Good morning. It's uh, wonderful to see so many people here and uh, you're in for a good presentation with uh, Brita. Dr. Brita L. Gill Austin is the Austin Philip Giles Professor of Psychology and Pastoral Theology Emerita at Andover Newton Theological School. An ordained pastor in the United Church of Christ, she has served in parishes for eight years before joining the faculty at Andover Newton in 1988. She holds a Master of Divinity degree from Harvard Divinity School and a PhD from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. As a pastoral theologian, Brita has a passion for teaching and creating a community of learning where the care of persons is embodied in a pedagogy that engages head and heart. For many years, her academic interests and specializations have centered around the integration of faith, sorry about that, health and spirituality, the psychology and spirituality of women, ecclesial models of care, the study of depression, and developmental psychology. And she could add, don't play with the lectern when you're reading the introduction. <laughs> Brita has contributed many articles and chapters to the field of pastoral theology, as well as a co-edited volume, Feminist and Womanist Pastoral Theology. In the last several years, her teaching, research, and writing have turned to examine the intersection of love and justice in relation to the care of those made poor by practices of exclusion. This has led to working with students to cross geographical and conceptual borders to enhance their understanding of the forces that deepen poverty and create divisions. As faculty director of Border Crossings Immersions, Brita led border crossing trips to Nicaragua, El Salvador, Mexico, and Myanmar for several years. For more than two decades, she has been committed to interfaith dialogue and work between Jews and Christians, and for the last several years, her work has included Muslims as well. She has also been active in work to stop the spread of global AIDS and to educate AIDS, orphans, and other vulnerable children in Zambia and India as a board member of Communities Without Borders. A good friend of the School of Theology and Ministry, Brita has also been a guest faculty presenter at our summer institute for many years, and she has also taught courses for us during the academic year, including last year, and here I'm going off script. One of the things I learned about Brita, she's an early riser. There are many times where we were kind of self-righteously uh, noting we were the only ones there at work. Um, <laughs> also on weekends, a very hard worker, a creative teacher. She is known for her interactive and practical approach to learning. It's my pl pleasure, to, oh, there's more, my gracious. This is, this is the longest introduction I have ever done and I do a lot of these. No, this is all good. An underlying theme that weaves through all her work is the centrality of connection to all healing and fostering those practices of connection that can bring healing to individuals, communities, and society as a whole. What better person to lead us in nurturing the healing power of joy? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brita gill Austin. So good morning, thank you so much Jane and thank you so much Dean Stedman and thank you so much Melinda Donovan for inviting me to this exciting day of ministry uh, renewal. And I am a very strong fan of the School of Theology and Ministry and it is always a delight to hang out with people here. So I rejoice in being with you. Um, you may think that it is perhaps just a bit strange that we take a time this morning to focus on the healing power of joy when our world is such a mess and when the last couple weeks have had such horrific, horrific violence. But the 
temptation today more than ever is that we can get stuck in the negative and we lose energy and then we lose focus and we in the process become disconnected from the source that allows us to keep furthering life in all its fullness wherever we are. Now, we all need joy to thrive. Without it, we languish. So let's just start there. So if you're going to talk about joy, then you can't not also talk a little bit. No, let's not talk. Let's just do it. We have to play. So I'm going to ask you to stand up a minute. So let's not forget that connection is at the very heart of joy. So we're going to do three things today together. We're going to first explore how the churches and our ministries have what I would call joy leaks, or what someone else would call our joy challenged. Then we're going to seek a deeper understanding of what happiness and joy are and what we know from our deepest experience about that, as well as what scientific research is telling us about its healing power. And the last thing we're going to do is talk about some spiritual practices that cultivate the ground in which the healing power of joy can grow and flourish in our lives. But I'd like to begin by telling a story. About five years ago, I noticed that I was missing out on conversations. I would miss the front and the back of words. And it became a bit frustrating, to put it mildly. But I just went on. And then one spring, I noticed that I couldn't hear the bird sing. I heard no bird song, and I love bird singing. So I said, I guess it's time to get my ears tested. And I went to the audiologist, and the audiologist told me that my main problem was that I couldn't hear fricatives, CK, TH, SH, those kind of things, and it could make it very hard. She said, if you spoke Chinese, you'd be fine because they don't have those. <laughs> And then she told me, but you have a severe loss of high notes, a severe loss of high pitch. So that was it. I wasn't going to go my whole life without hearing birdsong. So two hearing aids. So you get used to them. Then I went to the Azores with my family this summer, and we were in this most incredible park. I mean, it was one of the most beautiful places I have ever been in my life. And there was a cacophony of bird song all around, the most glorious I've ever heard. It was just startling. And all of a sudden, I'm walking on the path, and I just said, I wonder, this is so loud. So I took out my hearing aids. I couldn't hear a note. There had been symphony surround sound. I could not hear a single note. But put my hearing back in, eight, and the world came alive again. And guess what? I with it. So uh, I wonder if just maybe the church might have a joy leak like I had before I got my hearing aids. <laughs> Not perhaps from hearing loss, but from perhaps becoming just a wee bit deaf to the highest note of Christ's gospel, joy. Now this note of joy, I want to suggest, is missing in all its fullness in our churches, in our worship, in our theology, and in our ministry. Now you, whoops, 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 whoops. We're going to stay there for a while. <laughs> um, you probably know, most of you, that the most repeated words in the Bible are be not 
afraid or do not fear. But have you ever thought about that each time that those words are pronounced, they are followed with good news of joy? Fear not, good news. Fear not, good news. Eighty times in the Bible we hear this in some variation. So, for instance, in Genesis 26, 24, and the Lord appeared to Isaac the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father, fear not, for I am with thee, and I will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant, for Abraham's, my servant Abraham's sake. In Deuteronomy 31, be strong and of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid, for the Lord thy God goes with you, God will not fail you or forsake you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah. The good news that always comes after be not afraid is God is present. Martin Buber says that the translation of God's name as I am who I am that he gives to Moses on Mount Tarab is actually not the full meaning of the Hebrew word. The real meaning is I shall be present as I will be present. I shall be with you. I shall be present. I am presence. So what about the Christian gospel? Doesn't our story begin in Christmas with all the be not afraids to Joseph, to Elizabeth, to Mary, and then to the shepherds? But the good news is not just don't be afraid, but that God will be with us and dwell among us in the flesh. God so wanted us to have life and have it in all its abundance that God came to dwell among us and show us the way to joy. So in Jesus' farewell address in the book of John, we see that the divine will, first and foremost, is for us to be full of joy. Jesus said, I have come so that they might have life and have it in all its abundance. John 10, 10. Or these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be fill, full. John 15, 11. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be full. John 16, 24. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that, they may so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. John 17, 13. So God's desire is pretty simple. It's for God's joy to be fully in us. And Tyler de Chardin once said, the most infallible sign of God's presence is joy. And Pope Francis, in his book, The Gospel of Joy, said that the church will not grow by proselytizing, but by attraction. Now, I ask you, what attracts better than joy? But what happens when there's joy leaks? in our ministry and in the church. Ministry, lay and ordained, is one of the most blessed vocations in the world, but certainly it's one of the hardest. In a ministry support group this week, I heard a weariness from several in ministry that went bone deep, and the faces, from, and the faces were etched from exhaustion over many years. You might call it the sound of joy leaks. A love of ministry was there, absolutely, for sure. But there was also a sense of people coming to their limits, 
of so many crises, of so many demands, of so many deaths and heartaches and draining conflict, and for everyone, just fewer and fewer people to do the work. Does too much demand sometimes snuff out the joy of your ministry? Do agendas sometimes just take over your desire to just be present? Do you sometimes feel like a desert is growing in you while you're trying to water the wells of others' hearts? Does the gladness of, of ministry that brought you in to this work accompany you when you go to bed? We want to shine the light, the love, the joy of Jesus. For many of us, it seems to barely flicker through the demands of our days. So why is it that joy is so often lying in the outfield instead of closer to home base, in the really the moment to moment of daily ministry? In pastoral, care, in pastoral care, the focus for so long has been on suffering and pain and troubles of individuals, families, and communities at the expense of celebrating and seeing the good and where are the strengths are for people and building upon them. In the process, have we perhaps become too serious, too solemn, and developed serious joy leaks? What about the context of ministry, the church and its related institutions? We know their potential for healing and for helping people flourish, but don't we also often experience the church and its sister institutions limping on crutches rather than seeking deep healing for what ails them? Is it possible that we have soaked so long in the language of sin that the waters of negativity are so familiar that we don't even notice that we're drowning? Does the biting of an apple continue to speak louder than the goodness of creation? Have you ever asked yourself why of the three Abrahamic religions only Christianity believes in original sin? Has the suffering of Christ become more central to the church than remembering that Christ came, that we might have life and have it in all its fullness on earth, not just in heaven? Have guilt and shame blocked the entryway of churches and locked many hearts out of knowing that we are all beloved by God? And why are we surprised to see a picture of a laughing Jesus and think it's just a bit irreverent? <laughs> we experience the heartache of beloved churches closing. We're angry about abuse that is deeply harmful to children, draining trust and credibility in the church and its coffers. Many congregations don't seem to be as robust as we would hope, and fewer and fewer young people are attracted to the doors. We get discouraged, the church gets gloomier and more serious, and too much seriousness kills joy. So Jesuit James Martin puts it this way. He said, we simply have to start thinking of ourselves and the church as joy challenged. <laughs> so here's your task now. Where are you? Are your church joy challenged right now? Where might there be a joy leak in your ministry? or in your church. So take about three minutes apiece, turn to a partner, somebody you don't know, switch seats if you need to, and just talk about that for a few moments, okay? And I'll tell you at three minutes so you can change partners. Joy does not ignore the negative. It just doesn't let it become the last word, okay? So St. Catherine of Drexel, said something very close to Saint, I mean to Pope Paul, uh, Pope Francis, excuse me. 
Uh, we must attract people to the church by joy in order to lead them to its source, the heart of Christ. So I don't know, some of you may know the story of the Second Vatican encyclical entitled Godium et Spes, The Joys and Hopes, and how it came to be. It was originally called by the Council Fathers, The Grief and the Anguish. <laughs> but at the last minute, they canceled out the title and inserted The Joys and Hopes. And Gregory, Gregory Bowl comments that no new data rushed in on them. The world hadn't changed suddenly. They chose in a heartbeat to see the world differently. Do we nurture joy in part by how we see the Gospels, ourselves, others, the world? Does joy shift with our focus of attention? even in the most precarious and scary of times. This last week, I visited Beulah at St. Elizabeth's. She's been there almost every day, all day, since July 14th. I walked into the neonatal intensive care ward, and there she was with Devine, her preemie, in her arms with only a feeding tube, no incubator. When I first saw Devine, it was shortly after she was born and she was one pound, two ounces. She'd been born at 23 weeks. She was the smallest baby I have ever seen smaller than my hand. At 23 weeks, that high-tech incubator took over the work of Beulah's womb, and she carried her, not in her womb, but by her presence and her prayers day after day, week after week. And Beulah, last week, with tears in her eyes, told me, that she now weighs six pounds. I'm missing her after this event. She's six and a half now. Yesterday, no, day before yesterday, would have been her expected date of arrival. And then she said, all is well. She's fine. Her daughter is the youngest surviving preemie in the hospital's history. She had less than a 5% chance of living. Her daughter is an absolute miracle. But so is her presence with her daughter day after day. The nurses came to her just about a month ago and said, Beulah, you know, another woman had a premature baby, not as small as yours, but still very small. And she's so depressed. She's doing terribly. Would you mind speaking to her? And Beulah said, of course I will. So Beulah came to this woman, and the woman asked her, said, how do you do it? How do you go in that room without tears in your eyes and all the sadness of your heart and communicate that to your baby? How do you bring joy in the midst of such a precarious and fragile situation? And Beulah kind of took a deep breath. She says, it's not easy. I pray a lot. But every day, I walk into that hospital, and I go to the nurse's station, and I ask, is my baby still breathing? And they say, yes. Then I ask, did my baby move a limb, an arm, or a leg? And they say, yes. And then I look at them, and I say, praise be the spirit of life that moves in my baby. And then 
I go sit by her, I sing to her, I talk to her, I pray with her, I touch her with when I can, and I wait and I pray. Just reminded of the words of Lewis Thomas who said, Statistically, the probability of any one of us being here is so small that you think the mere fact of existence itself would keep us all in a contented dazzlement of surprise. Do we forget that we also are the miracle? Take a moment, just in silence, and think of a time when you, or someone you knew, found joy when they least expected it, or in the midst of a very difficult time. Take, take just a few moments and recall that moment or time in your life where joy surprised you. And if you can, just take one word or phrase as something to hold on to that was key in joy and you being to able to feel joy in the midst of a very difficult time. You're not going to ask to be asked to share this. Okay, so what is joy and how are we going to distinguish it from happiness? Joy and happiness. So, happiness, as we normally think of it, has to do more with a, to a reaction to external circumstances. It actually comes from the old English, hap, meaning happenstance, or by chance. It is reactive to a stimulus, having and doing the right stuff. It's often equated with pleasure, or what is called the hedonic treadmill. Now, what's important is that happiness in our time has often been trivialized, and so has joy. These smiley faces aren't even the right way to smile. <laughs> Do you know that? Because when you smile, you use the zega, uh, the zegormaticus major, which raises the corners of your mouth, just like that. But if you only raise the corners of your mouth, it's a fake smile. You have to use the opicularis oculi, which are those crow's feet, all those wonderful wrinkles around your eyes up here. Praise God for these, because when you smile and the crow's feet with your eyes wrinkled, that means it's genuine, not false. That is false smiles, okay? So try a different emo, emo whatever you call it. Get the ones, you know, with the wrinkles. They're good. Now, Robert Seligman, who was the president of the American Association, Psychological Association, has spent most of his life studying depression and helplessness, one of the major researchers. And at around 2000, he began to think that he may be going down the wrong road, realizing that psychology, since its birth, has been paying attention primarily to disease and pathology and what is wrong with people, rather than trying to discover what makes life worth living, what makes people happy? What makes people feel a sense of well-being? And, and he began thinking about it. And then he said the birth of positive psychology actually began the day his five-year-old turned to him and said, Dad, if I can stop my whining, why can't you learn to stop being such a grouch? And Seligman was beginning to learn, as we know, about the neuroplasticity of the brain. Whoops, where'd that come from? Sorry. Uh, was learning about the neuroplasticity of the brain and, in fact, that we could 
make changes. So he wrote his first book called Authentic Happiness. And he was trying to lay out what a good life might look like, but he didn't want to be called a happyologist because he thought people would start thinking this. Well, what he was really talking about and still talks about is much closer to the Greek notion of edelmania. This is all in your packet, by the way, but you don't have to follow it. Uh, the, Greek, the Greek word means something more like flourishing. And for Aristotle, it meant that the happiness was pursuing a good life through virtue, or that happiness was something much more than pleasure, but had to do with right action, serving a noble purpose. So people who flourish don't just feel good. In the ancient understanding of happiness, they also did good. So it's not just about feeling. And Barbara Friedrichsen says, it requires transcending self-interest enough to share and celebrate the goodness in others in the natural world. So happiness, joy, is something that isn't just a feel good, it actually leads us to do good in the world. Now, Seligman came up in trying to define what a flourishing, oh, so he said, I'm not using the word happiness because everybody disses it and trivializes it. I'm going to use the word flourishing. And he wanted to know what helps build a flourishing life. And he came up with this acronym or five things that he thinks are critical. Positive emotions, engagement with activities that engage you fully and move you into a flow state engaged with the world. I'll say more about these. Relationships, social networks, meaning something larger than yourself, and accomplishments. Now, I've put these in my kind of revisionist Christian framework. I can't ask him to do that as a Jew. But this is what I call PERMA, because I've added something, and have scriptures for each one, and how I see this through a Christian lens of joy. Positivity has to do with positive meaning and attitudes which trigger positive emotions and behavior. A joyful heart is good medicine, we're told in Proverbs 17. Engagement has to do with engaging in activities that engage you so fully that you lose self-consciousness and lose a sense of self-absorption. He who loses his life will find it. Relationships have to do with loving relationships that create a sense of belonging and show compassion. You shall love others as I have loved you. Meaning and purpose and direction have to do with being committed to something larger than ourselves. You should love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And accomplishment has not to do simply with success, but a sense of making a difference, of giving one a real, a realistic sense of self-esteem and well-being. By their fruits, you shall know them. And then I added H, because I don't think for a Christian you can continue to have joy without hope. And hope is the sense that there is an open future and may the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace so that the power of the Holy Spirit may abound in you, abound in hope. So, we can talk about joy as an emotion and multiple other emotions and uh, dispositions flow out of joy. So joy generates other positivity, other good things. But it's also an inner disposition that's rooted in one's relationship to God for Christians and being connected, as we'll talk about, to one's essential identity as, beloved, as a beloved child of God. And it's the fruit of the spirit that brings that fruit to wherever one is. So that joy is not something that is dependent upon external circumstances. It has more of a transcendent character that's connected to something larger than the small self. And joy is intimately connected then to our relationship to God, 
gratitude and using our gifts in the service of others. So we talk about is joy is what brings the peace that passes all understanding. And that comes from knowing that divine love is a part of us and all that is, and we cannot fall out of this love. It's an inner strength. It's a virtue. It can be a way of life as well as a spiritual path. And it is an act of resistance against despair. And it's a fruit of the spirit that comes from being deeply connected to Christ within. Okay, so those are a few of some of the most critical pieces of joy from a Christian perspective. perspective. And I think these words by Pope Francis are essential. He says, joy adapts and changes, but it always endures, even as a flicker of light born of our personal certainty that when everything is said and done, we are infinitely loved. Our Henry Nouwen, for anyone who has the courage to enter our human sorrow deeply, there is a revelation of joy hidden like a precious stone in the wall of a cave. So, joy is at the center of Christian life. So I had you talk about the healing links, and, the healing links, and where you might be joy challenged. Now I want you to talk about the healing power of joy in your life, and I think you'll notice something changes in your body, in your heart, in your mind as you talk about it. So I want you to turn now to another person, and I want you to describe a time when you were bursting with joy in ministry, when you were so full of that joy that you couldn't contain it. You were jumping or you were smiling or you were whatever. You just, you couldn't contain it. It was so overflowing. I want you to describe how you felt at the time of that moment of joy in ministry and what stayed with you afterwards. What did you notice about the afterglow? What was the afterglow of joy? And most importantly, what did you feel like doing after that experience of joy? What did you feel like doing, okay? You know, I think ministry uh, renewal events like this, their single most important pur uh, purpose is to help people connect with each other. That's why it's always hard to get people's attention back here because it really should be here. <laughs> so I will try to move through this last part quickly so that you can have a break and have more time to connect with each other. So I want you to just take a minute. Can everybody read this? Yeah? So I just want to go through this very quickly that you see some of the, the most important things about the healing power of joy. It doesn't just have intrinsic value but it adds zest and vitality and delight to our lives. One of the things we know is that joyous people have a much higher capacity for resilience in the face of adversity, and there have been multiple research studies done on this. We also know that joy increases social cohesion. It helps people connect, and they make less distinctions between self and other, less us, us and them kind of language and it actually increases our capacity to care. It increases our creativity, and you'll see why in just a moment, as well as a sense of agency and efficacy. And it makes us more self-confident because we also are able to sustain interest in something when we are joyful. And joy helps sustain our work for the common good, and it draws us in to uh, something of the transcendent. But it doesn't just contribute to our psychological well-being. We know that joy has a powerful effect on reducing stress by reducing the cortisol and the nipherine that's in our systems. Our bodies, in fact, respond to things that have emotional impact for us, especially positive uh, emotions, with the release of certain hormones, and among the most is important is oxytocin, which calms the nervous system. And oxytocin is always present 
when you are feeling loved or loving or, or loved by someone else. Uh, joy also, we don't talk near enough about and we don't have time to today, but absolutely adds to communal healing. Gloria Durka, Dirk, Christian Education, uh, once said that celebration is the most democratic of all activities because celebration erases categories between people and connects people. So a neuroscientist at the University of San Francisco uh, in, uh, in the uh, medical school there, Richard Davison, says that there are four brain uh, circuits that impact our lasting well-being. There are four brain circuits. And he says that one of those brain circuits is our ability to maintain positive states. So positivity is actually a word that became very popular by uh, Barbara Friedrichsen, who is a researcher, psychologist, and neuroscience at the University of North Carolina. And she says that positivity includes positive meanings and optimistic attitudes that trigger positive emotions, as well as open minds, tender hearts, relaxed limbs, and the soft faces they usher in. Now, for years, people have been studying the negative emotions, anger, fear, despair, um, and looked what those negative emotions do to us psychologically and physically. And what do we know? We know without a doubt that the negative emotions raise your blood pressure. Uh, they, they also constrict your thinking and make you less creative. Where positive emotions now being studied for the first time for the last several years, but there are hundreds of studies going on now, show that the positive emotions have an incredible effect on us. And these are the 10 that she names. They're in your packet and outlined what they are. And here's what they do. She says that all the positive emotions have a way of broadening and building us. Because what positivity does, just like when you speak about your experience of joy, it opens you up. It opens the mind and the heart, and it makes us more receptive. It makes us more creative because we're more open, so more ideas come in, and we feel more connected. It also broadens people's ideas about possible actions so that it opens people to a wider range of thoughts and actions than is normal, so it makes people more efficacious and more, uh, have more agency. And it also gives greater perspective and capacity visually to distinguish diversity. This is one of an interesting, really interesting parts of the study that she did is that, that because when you're in a positive disposition, you see more clearly. So people in one of the positive states where normally people recognize people semi-well that are within their own uh, ethnic groups. So whites tend to recognize whites fine, blacks tend to recognize blacks, Europe, uh, Asians, Asians. But across groups, we are less likely to remember people and their faces. Positive emotions, for some reason, allow people to tune in and to remember those differences in helping toward connectivity. So the healing part of positive emotions, of which joy is one, is they broaden the possibilities that we can consider. Thus, we become more creative and thoughtful, and they build more intellectual, social, and physical resources for coping. Now, there's a wonderful YouTube. This is, this is in your packet, the reference here. You can just go to Why Happier People Do It Better. It's seven minutes long. It's really fun. Um, and it basically shows through an experiment that has been replicated time after time after time that when people have a positive feeling, when they're feeling a sense of joy and a sense of well-being and goodness, and this was an experiment that has been, as I said, repeated where people were given 
candy and greeted very warmly and told how much how glad people were to see them. And then another group was just brought in and told to sit down. And then they were given the same task. I'm not going to take away the excitement because look at the, the, the YouTube. But what's just astounding is that it absolutely shows that people who come in with a positive disposition are much more creative and able to solve problems and think through things to, uh, uh, in a much more creative and expansive way. So one scholarly paper looked at actually studies done with more than 275,000 people on, with 300 different studies and what they showed is that positivity itself predicts flourishing and success in life, I define it as a deep sense of well-being, as much as it reflects success. In other words, flourishing positive emotions help you become better in your work, happier in your marriage, healthier. It isn't that health, a good marriage, and work in itself just helps you flourish, okay? The positivity itself contributes. So one of the most famous studies, many of you may know this, is the Sisters of Notre Dame. Do any, how many of you know this study? Oh, so maybe I don't need to talk about it, except one of the things we're really grateful for is that there are so many sisters and their convents have taken such detailed records for so long on these lives that they're now using them for this incredible research of which this was the first and now doing work around these same sisters with Alzheimer's. But what's the most important thing they found in one of the first studies? Because they had records from nuns, in the beginning of when they entered the convent, they had to write an essay about how they felt coming into religious life. And then they co went back and looked at those 50 years later. And the they coded them for the positive words used in description, for the negative words used, and for the uh, uh, neutral words used. And they found clearly that the nuns who expressed at the time that they entered the convent more joyous positivity about being in the convent over neutral or negative lived on average 10 years longer than all the other nuns. And at age 85, 90%, why does it keep doing that? 90% uh, of the happiest quartal were still alive, whereas only 34 of the least happy were. So positivity builds better physical health. You can see because of the stress hormones we've talked that it lowers, and we know when stress is higher, your immunity system goes down and you become much more vulnerable to disease. Positivity counteracts that because it enhances the immune function through more dopamine and opioids. It also diminishes inflammatory responses. It lowers blood pressure, pain levels, helps you sleep better, and has fewer colds. And the lower risk, there's a lower risk for hypertension, diabetes, stroke, and lower disease rates across the board. And that scientists have shown that people who, ha who have more positivity in their life live longer lives. Okay, so here's the next one. So, this is great. So, you know, we have, we should be positive. But the problem is, as uh, John Hansen, the neuroscientist, says, the problem is that we were wired for negativity in order to survive. Because that's what we used to my have to confront. So, if you are concerned about survival, staying alive, staying alive is the most important thing. And when you see a carrot that looks delicious, but the stick is moving and you know it could be a threat, you're going to pay attention to the threat because it's survival. But here's the thing. Neuroscientist Ron Hansen and all the neuroscientists saying that there's an incredible thing about our brain. It's neuroplasticity, which means it changes. And it changes by getting new information or what we take in or what we stay with. And the problem 
is that negative experiences and negative comments, anything negative, it's like Velcro. It sticks to you. It sticks to you because we're wired for negativity to pay attention to threats to anything that we think could harm us. And the positive is like a Teflon pan. It goes boom. You don't stay. So, you, you know, think about any time where, you know, you get a work evaluation and you've got nine things that are awesome off the charts, but there's one person who's got it out for you. And that's what you pay attention to. That's what sticks. We're wired because that's where the thread is. Now, neuroscience says, and this is called the Locio Losado theory, that what you have to do now is you have to change the balance. So for every negative comment or experience, you've got to have three positives in order that it become Velcro and not Teflon. Okay? Now, what's really interesting, they say in marriage, you need one to five. <laughs> and I would think that would have to do with living people in a religious community as well. So, positivity rates. If you really want to flourish, you've got to have a positivity ratio of three to one. If you're coping, it's just going to be keeping your head above water is two to one. But you're going to languish with little sign of hope if you only have one to one. And depression is when the negativity outweighs the positivity. Now, here's the amazing thing. People think, you know, well, some people are just happier than others. They're just born that way. Well, actually, some of it's true. There's 40% that has now been shown that is genetically in us. We're just some people are born more sanguine, more cheerful, more whatever, 40%. But they found that 10%, only 10% is due to circumstances for happiness. People who win the lottery, they're as happy as can be. A year later, they're no happier than they were than they won the lottery. Somebody who becomes a paraplegic is not happy for the first year, but after a year, they're just as happy as they were the year before, in often cases. Okay? What matters is 50%. It's what you choose, intentional activities, how you orient yourself, what you see, what you focus on. And here's the critical piece that we'll end with so you can go savor the uh, delicious... Um, muffins and things over there. Peterson, who is one of the major uh, positive psychologists, says savoring is that those who habitually savor are indeed happier and more satisfied in general of life, more optimistic and less depressed than those who do not savor. And what's the importance of this? Because savoring means you really take something in. So how do you savor? <sighs> Why this keeps doing that? You savor, first of all, by sharing it with somebody. Your joy increases if you share it with somebody. Did you know a, a joy not shared is halved? Okay? You, share, you savor it by building a memory, by taking a picture or getting an image in your mind of an event that you can hold on to because that's part of the three to one. That's part of building what has sticking power. Self-congratulations. When your, your joy comes from, it went well. It went well. It's the self-congratulations with, I did OK. <laughs> you know, that's a, a healthy pride. Not all pride is sinful. And then there's the sharpening of perceptions. And one of the ways you savor is by focusing on the very best of that event so you, or that experience so you don't let it move away. And then last, you savor by absorption. And that means just by really taking in the joy, the compliment, the, 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 the music, whatever it is. You let it come over you and you hold it. You don't rush away from it. You absorb it. That's like building your positivity ratio so you can have positivity that's Velcro instead of Teflon. Okay? So how do we nurture this healing power of joy? You can't command joy, but you can nurture it. 
by planting seeds that help it to flourish. And although we can make room for joy in our life in many ways, today, this morning, I just want to highlight briefly three practices that I think are absolutely key. Um, and the first practice is grounding ourselves in our essential identity and being in communion with God and one another. So, I want you to imagine Jesus approaching the River Jordan. Notice that he joins with other human beings in this act of repentance, not letting his ego set him apart or above others. He submits himself to the same ritual. Imagine, as he emerges from the water, that he hears a voice that tattoos on his heart an identity that will not let him go. You are my beloved son. Now, this is not some sweet love note, some valentine sent from heaven by a dove. No. This is an earth-shattering, cataclysmic moment when he emerges from those waters with a visceral connection to who he is and who whose he is. He knows now beyond a shadow of a doubt he is God's beloved son. And knowing who he is and whose he is will impact everything from this moment on. So he's driven into the wilderness by the spirit where he's tempted for 40 days by the great seducer, Satan who goads him and lures him and manipulates him and misleads and tempts him again and again, trying to get him to distort and twist the meaning of his sonship by asking him to use his power in self-serving ways. And each time and every time he puts up his hand as a sign of his refusal to let the adversary define what sonship means. All the demons and temptations that we wrestle with in our lives are fundamentally an attempt to make us forget who we really are and to seduce us into believing lies about ourselves, that we are not good enough, or worthy enough, or smart enough, or wealthy enough. Whatever it is, we are tempted by something to make us feel that we need to fill a hole inside. And temptations are always that which leads us away from being grounded in knowing who and whose we are, our essential identity. Now, the gospel then tells us that Jesus was with wild beasts and the angels ministered at him. Now, I imagine this as a moment where Jesus had a profound experience of inner knowing where he is bathed in the light of God's love, where he knows that the divine is in him, with him, all around him, and that he cannot be separated from that love that penetrates all of creation. He knows in this moment that he cannot fall outside of God's loves. He knows is in the words of Julian of Norwich, that he is one, knit and one to God. And only when he knows this, in the depth of his being, does his ministry begin. Now, C.S. Lewis says that what God wants for us is to be filled with joy so that we become dazzling, dazzling, radiant, incandescent creatures that God created us to be. Very close to that is the words of St. Arenas, 
The glory of God is a human being, fully, utter, totally alive. To become this alive, we need to know at a cellular level, in the deepest part of our very being, that Christ dwells with us and within us, and that we are all God's beloved children. Teresa of Avila roots that all our vulnerabilities in life come from a lack of self-knowledge. We forget who lives at the center of our being. So the central question for us in nurturing joy needs to be, how do we make this truth a lived experience for ourselves and everyone we meet? Not an intellectual proposition, but a conviction that is so tattooed upon our heart that everything grows from this truth and we cannot let it go. Because we also know that divine nature has been awakened in us. That is our true DNA. Now, I have struggled many years, many, too many, with a meditation practice. But I have come to believe with my whole heart that contemplative prayer is one of the most profound ways that we come to know and stay connected to our essential identity, that we are knit and one to God. And we can seed that ground and that awareness of our belovedness through centering prayer and other forms of meditation. I have found it helpful to add a bodily practice and a few words before I begin my own meditation in the morning. So I'd like us to just pause for a few moments and lead you in meditation and have you do it in the way I do it. Not that you have to do it that way, but invite you to just try this and see if it might make any difference for you. But is any practice, any practice only makes a difference when it's repeated over and over and over again. That's what makes a practice. And the neurocircuitry in our brain only rewires after we practice and practice so new connections are made. So I ask you now to get in a comfortable position with your back against the chair but where you relax and where your breathing is flowing slowly. I ask you to release any tension that you may be holding in any part of your body by tightening it and releasing it anywhere where you feel discomfort. Just do this for a moment. Let your eyes close, and if you're comfortable doing so, close your eyes, but if you're not, find a soft focus in the room. Take a few deep breaths and notice the sensation of your breath first in your abdomen. Then feel your inhalation in your chest. Then feel your breath passing through your nostrils. And finally, through your mouth. Now take a couple of deep breaths. And just breathe naturally and normally and let your breath be.
Now I ask you to place your hands one on top of the other over your heart. Feel the warmth of your hands. Feel the gentleness and the loving kindness of this gesture. Feel this as loving touch. Now with your hands folded over your heart, repeat to yourself silently these words. Christ dwells within me. I am a beloved child of God. I am knit and one to God and all there is. Let yourself repeat these words slowly, letting them sink into your being, into every cell and fiber of who you are. Christ dwells within me. I am a beloved child of God. I am knit and one to God and all that is. And now just drop into this deep knowing with your hands open if you prefer in your lap using your breath or a centering word to anchor you. When your mind wanders, just notice it wandering. That's what the mind does. And just gently bring it back to your breath or to your word. With every breath, feel the spaciousness of your being grounded in God. Just sit quietly, letting this knowledge that Christ dwells in you, that you are God's beloved child, that you are knit and one to God and all that is. Settle into the very center of your being. We will sit for a few minutes. And when I ring the gong, I ask that you come out of your meditation with your hands in prayer position at your heart. When I end my meditation, I always cross my hands at my heart like this. And 
I'm usually alone, but I bow and I say, the divine dwells in each person. Every child is a beloved child of God. We are all knit and one to God and each other. And I do that because it sets the tone for my whole day. Calvin Turley, a pastoral theologian, once said that all pathology in our world comes from a mistaken identity. We forget who we are, whose we are, and we forget who every other person we meet and is in this world, who they are and whose they are. Meditation is just one tool, one way, but it's one way that opens the gate to the, to the joy that dwells in the very center of our being. So, I think I'll leave questions till the end, okay? And I love this picture. Who can't feel joy in that? So our next practice is nurturing the healing power of joy through watering our days with gratitude and gratitude practices. I want to ask you, some of you, there's enough who are what I would call a little bit older in this room, that you might remember that when someone did something for you or a favor, we might actually say, I'm much obliged, or I'm in your debt. But we don't like to feel obliged today. We don't want to feel dependent on others, or certainly in debt. And yet, if our eyes are open to all of reality, we see that creation is interwoven into a dance of mutual interdependence. If anything, ecology and its web has taught us so much about this. And gratitude is a practice that helps shift in a fundamental way our deeply embedded and I think very troublesome notions and perceptions of our self-sufficiency and independence to deeply appreciate and acknowledge how interdependent we really are. Gratitude is one of the ways that we are reminded that we are knit and one to God and to each other. But there's a funny thing, you know? Gratitude is really the sexy practice out there now. It's everywhere. But Barbara Ehrenreich, sociologist, reminds us that many gratitude practices forget to put the you, the you, in the thank you, and do not have any interaction or communication with another. Consider this, she says, from a yoga instructor on CNN.com. Cultivate your sense of gratitude by incorporating giving thanks into a personal morning ritual such as writing in a gratitude journal, repeating an affirmation, or practicing a meditation. It could be even as simple as writing what you give thanks for on a sticky note and posting it on your mirror or computer. To help you establish a daily routine, create a thankfulness reminder on your phone or computer, an app to pop up every morning and prompt you to be thankful. 
none of these practices actually involves thanking or interacting with a you. It misses one of the primary gifts of gratitude is that it bonds us and connects us to others and helps us to know our interdependence. They're all about many of the gratitude practices today about making us just feel good. Um, without including the you in our thank yous, we don't acknowledge our indebtedness, our interconnectedness, or our call to be more connected to God and each other through loving kindness and justice. So I want to suggest that gratitude, genuine gratitude, always pays it forward. Gratitude is uh, being shown by scientific research, much being done today, that it's not only a major, major nutrient for our sense of well-being, for our sense of happiness and joy in our lives, but gratitude begets generosity. People who are grateful to God and to others show extraordinarily more acts of loving kindness and doing good in the world than those who are ungrateful. And it is gratitude and that generosity of spirit that comes out of it that leads to joy, that makes us more connected to others, that reminds us how we are knit and one to God and to one another. So gratitude practices are so common and so much a part of the church, and particularly the Ignatian community. But I need to say that if you don't have a practice of gratitude that follows you through your day, literally, moment to moment, from moment to moment, you will miss the high note of joy in your life. Saint uh, Ignatius Loyola said this, ingratitude is the most abominable of sins and the cause beginning, beginning and origin of all sins and misfortune. True, but could we say it please? a little more positively. <laughs> Gratitude is at the heart of a joy and flourishing life and what God most wants for you. Be grateful. For those schooled in Ignatian spirituality, the examine is like daily bread. For if you find God in all things like St. Ignatius did, then gratitude simply becomes a way of praying without ceasing. So I was going to do two gratitude, uh, a gratitude practice, but I'm going to save it uh, and ask you to do it at home. And it's a very special practice. And there's another one that's in your, uh, uh, your um, packet that you can do. Uh, let me just tell you the second one. One of the ways we savor and one of the ways we grow gratitude is to hold moments, hold very special moments. And writing poetry, very simple poetry, is one of the ways you can increase gratitude. Mary Oliver says, I don't know how to pray, but I know how to pay attention. I know how to kneel down in the grass and pay attention. If you're paying attention to your day, Gratitude is going to be everywhere. So just remember that a practice of simple poetry can be one. But perhaps another, and one of ones I really want you to think about doing in your free time, is writing a letter of gratitude. Now let's face it, folks. Most of us don't get letters anymore, except thank you notes for little kindnesses and favors. I'm not talking about a thank you note. 
I'm talking about a letter of deep gratitude to someone in your life that has made visible for you in some way God's love for you so that it's palpable, that you carry it with you, that they've been such an influence in your life in some way that you can't imagine your life being what it is without them. Have you ever sat down and really wrote a letter in detail with thick descriptions telling them in particular, specifically, what you've received from them? How much in debt you are to them? How grateful. Now here's the kicker. And lots of studies done on this, people. Don't do it because of that, but I'll just tell you. People who write letters of gratitude, they feel filled with joy. They feel so overflowing with joy. But guess what? You pass it on. Do you know what it's like? I do, because I've received a few of them. When you get a letter like that, somebody tells you you've made a difference in their life. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to those who kept you company and helped you be who you are. So write a letter of gratitude tonight, okay? So here's our third practice. We all know that Joy does not come without self-giving love. That is the message of Jesus. But my dear friends, we've got to look at this a different way. So everybody stand up, please. OK, I'm a, I'm a um, professor of pastoral theology, and my theology is hokey pokey theology. Because I believe with all my heart that God, that Jesus came, that, me, we, that we might have life and we might have it in all its abundance. And that Jesus wants us to live a life of self-giving. But self-giving is first and foremost not about self-denial, self-sacrifice, self-abnegation, what I call the unholy trinity. <laughs> but first and foremost, about self-transcendence, getting our little, tiny, puny ego eye enough out of the way so that we can put ourselves, our belovedness, and all the giftedness that God gave us into the center of the wholeness of our being. You know those moments. You know those moments when you're just there. And God's there. And you're there, but it's that deep you. It's not that little you watching the tyranny of the they over your shoulder. And why? I'll bet you a dollar. No, much too little in these days and days. But I don't have a lot more. <laughs> that you're living from your place of giftedness. Giftedness is something we're given. It's natural to us. It's a gift from God to us. Our strength and our gifts foremost are gifts we've received. And what makes a joyful life is when we take that, when we have that sense of utter joy in being about and offer it up to others. It's not about self-sacrifice and self-denial. That may come in the joy of offering up what it is you love to do. This hardness, difficult, things are costly. It may happen. 
but to live into joy and to bring joy to others. You've got to live from that place where you bring your whole self in and you take that little self out, that ego. And to do that, you need to know what your gifts and strengths are. And you need to claim them. You need to frame them. Frame them as one of the things that draws your attention and focus for what will bring joy to you and others. So I've got an exercise for you. Mm -hmm. There are on every table frames and they're paper. There's some big frames and some little frames. Some of you are feeling more arty than others. Use, use the big frames. And there's materials of um, crayons and pencils and all sorts of stuff in there. And there's scotch tape or paste uh, glue that you can put the paper on the back of the frame. And what I want you to do is I want you to frame your gifts and strengths that help you love with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your might. And to think about those strengths, you might just look here. Hold on. So, a gift or a strength, if you're not sure what they are, this is here. One of the ways that you can do this, friends, is you can take a test that's put out by the VI uh, Value Center in action, and there's a list, and I don't want you to go there now. Please do not go there. In the back, in your packet, there are a list of character strengths that are part of positive psychology. At the bottom of that list is a place where you can go and for free get your character strengths, as Martin Seligman and Peterson would call them, that have been narrowed down to 24 that are universal, that they've done an incredible research that these are six virtues and 24 strengths that are worldwide. And then they'll tell you how, how what that gift is and how you can do with it. They give you a profile. And one of the things that they will tell you is that the most important thing about identifying your strengths and gifts is if you want to increase your flourishing and your joy, quote, in life, then you have to learn how to use it in more and more places, in places you've never used it before. You have to think, where could I use that in a new way, in a novel way? And I want you to write that on the back of your frame. But I think there's a less scientific way that is just as good. And you might just take a piece of paper for a minute, and don't be too fast at this, and write down three people who know you really, really well. Just do it for a minute. Write down three people who know you really well from three different parts of your life. From three different parts of your life, if you can. OK? And next to each of those people, write what they would identify as your strength. Write what they would identify as your strength. And then take those, and then take those, and think about what you yourself would own according to this list, what they say is a gift or strength. It's not skills. Skills are things we develop. A, a, a gift is something that you almost cannot use. It's so much a part of you, okay? A gift here, in some ways, represents the very best of you. It's when you are most alive, when you are most joyful, when you are in the flow, and you're not self-conscious, and you're just doing what you love. That's a gift, okay? Then put in that frame in any way you want whether it's word, words, whether it's collage, whether it's color, you, you just use your creativity and fill it up in some way so that when you look at this frame, you know that's where I'm gonna live from. When I was in confirmation, I was given a gold medal. 
that I wore around my heart all the time for many, 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 many years was very precious to me. It said, God is first, others are second, you're third. That is a really rotten, lousy recipe for ministry. And I am very concerned that our ministry be filled with joy, because if we don't have joy-filled ministries, we don't have joy-filled churches and joy-filled institutions that are related to the churches. So what did I learn from a psychologist? I read it, and I go, oh, my God, that's a possibility? She said, Carol Gilligan, women in particular, but giving men, I think it's the same, have to learn how to include themselves in the equation of those to be cared for. Those, the, we have to learn how to include ourselves in the equation to be uh, cared for. And one of the ways that I've learned in working with others in ministry that most helps people stay alive and well is doing these practices, spiritual practices that, that, that I've been describing are critical, but living out of your giftedness, not your weaknesses. To emphasize your strengths makes such a difference, and I know no better definition of vocation than what comes from Friedrich Buchner when he said, vocation is the place where your own deepest gladness and the world's hunger meet. Vocation is the place where your own deepest gladness and the world's hunger meet. Okay. You have questions, comments, things you want to raise, anything? It hasn't been a lot of back and forth, and I'm sorry, but I realize that I am uh, shy with big groups because of my hearing. Okay, so if you have a question, just speak up and let me know. Yes. So in one of your slides that I don't think you got to go over, it says, what behaviors lead to a flourishing life? Yeah. And the first one is they exercise regularly. Is that physical? Yes, exercise? yes. I, I put extra things on that uh, handout that come from the work on flourishing and positive psychology, and these are all behaviors that they have identified that are very critical to a sense of well-being. And exercise is very high because we know that it literally gets all the positive hormones going in us that makes us feel better. Also, you should know just that they've done uh, research on uh, people who flourish. And people who use their gifts every day are six times more likely to say that they have a deep sense of well-being and they're flourishing. Six times more people who use those gifts every day. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, I had to, just had to say at the break to Brita, Brita, you are a joy. You are the definition of joy. <laughs> So, Professor, uh, my question is, could it be that we in the church who have this special ministry of forgiveness, uh, which is a source of joy, uh, could it be that we have betrayed that because at the end of Eucharist, which means Thanksgiving, gratitude, um, it's so solemn and quiet, and uh, would you suggest we introduce the hokey pokey? <laughs> Slowly, man, slowly. <laughs> no, I wouldn't suggest that. <laughs> I learned that in my first year of ministry when I changed, tried to change the doxology to inclusive language. So no, I wouldn't do that. Um, I think we need to think of ways that the Eucharist, which is such an incredible place of thanksgiving that leads to thanks living, is we think how can we celebrate this Mass. I mean, that's, you know, it's one of the fabulous things. I'm not Catholic, but I love it that you celebrate Mass. Get the celebrate back in. And what would that mean? And how do we change it maybe slowly, briefly? How do we connect maybe people a little bit more with each other also during that? Because that is the source of where we find God is also in each other. Um, but I think that takes, you know, literally just think, what, what would it mean to celebrate and put your, get together with folk and brainstorm. 
but don't start with a hokey pokey. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No, I hope I'm not a heretic. <laughs> but I, I like interfaith, and I get a lot of joy going to the Jewish temple. And the best part, well, I love the service, but after the service, there's oneg. Yes. And it's the breaking of bread, mm -hmm. that everybody's touching the shoulder, joyful, and we give pieces. And I said, yeah. I wish we could do something with the Eucharist like that, because the prayers, the Baruch, Baruch yeah. is, is just a blessed uh, be this bread from the work of our hands. Mm -hmm. That if we and that I'm reading a book about the Jewish faith that Jesus never left the Jewish religion, then why did we? <laughs> you know, if we can get back there somehow and their joy in the celebration. Thank you. That's a wonderful. It's a wonderful part of Shabbat celebration and how they always share. So just if you're looking for something to do on a Friday night and you want more joy in your life, I'm doing a ad. Beth Zion, it's on Beacon Street in Brookline, six o'clock. They have a Naria service that goes for an hour before their regular Shabbat service. It started with 20 about six weeks ago. There are now 200 people who are coming. It will blow your socks off in terms of joy. It's all about joyous singing and violins and trumpets and guitar and African drums and chanting. And you don't have to know Hebrew. You will get caught up and realize, oh my God, this is what we're missing. Okay, 17th, it's a third, it's I think it's the third Friday, but I know it's next Friday, the 17th at Beth Zion, Z-I-O-N, at, on Beacon Street, I don't know the address, you can look it up, 6 p.m., get there early so you get a seat. It's awesome, guys, awesome. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? One thing I just want to acknowledge, um, it's really important, you know, if you go to church um, and there's only joy and nothing else and you're in the pits, you've just lost somebody you care for, you lost your job, you're feeling like you're not worth anything, you're in a deep depression, you're worried, worried, and all the service is is joy, you may not come back again either. And why is that? because it's not real, okay? Joy doesn't come to everyone at the same moment, at the same time, and to just have joy in our churches is a sin against the Holy Spirit because we know that God is also with those who suffer, that sometimes you have to be in the dark, and uh, the slide did not come up for, I don't know what's happening to this thing, but I had on the opening, you know, the beautiful color with all the colors and in the, the, the title of this workshop of, um, what is it? Nurturing the Healing Power of Joy. And it was all colorful. And the last slide was all black with one little light. To remember that sometimes joy comes very slowly with just that much. Um, and a friend of mine who um, committed suicide, uh, tried to commit suicide, said, I could always hang in there as long as I knew there was one star in the night. But when I couldn't see that one star, I was in deep trouble. And we're that star sometimes for other people. So I just say that in my own apologies and real humility that I am just very limited <laughs> And I just couldn't get more in in this three hours, but I'm very aware that that piece is missing. But it's not to say that the whole service needs to be joyful because you'd leave a lot of people behind. And the joy comes also in knowing that we're acknowledged where we are and that we belong wherever that might be. Okay, anything else? Yes.
So the Holy Spirit uh, was with me in Starbucks and knew that I was coming here because their new Christmas mug is flourish. <laughs> yeah. All right. You know, uh, I'm just going to have one final word as I look at that because of positive psychology and all this, you know, gratitude being everywhere now and everything. We can, you know, part of us be kind of, uh, it's all new age secular stuff. You know, it's okay. It's okay if it takes 2,000 years for people to find out and discover what the scriptures have been telling us forever. It's okay that neuroscience and other science is actually telling us that when we don't hide from our own kin, when we shelter the naked in, give hungry to the poor, and then our light will dawn and we will be like a wound newly healed. That was the promise of Isaiah. That's promise it's still there. So it's okay if Starbucks says flourish. It's okay if you learn meditation someplace else. It's okay if you learn. It doesn't matter. God speaks to us everywhere and in all things. So let me just close with a benediction that I love by Father Giovanni. I salute you. There is nothing I can give you which you have not, but there is much that while I cannot give, you can take. No heaven can come to us unless our hearts find rest in today. Take heaven. No peace lies in the future which is not hidden in the present moment. Take peace. The gloom of the world is but a shadow. Behind it, yet within our reach, is joy. Take joy. Thank you.